Chapter Six of the Wonderful Adventures of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When I come back to look upon that Saxon period spent in the green shades of my sweet Franklin's homestead, it seems perhaps that never was there a time so peaceful before in the experience of this passion tossed existence. We hunted and we hawked, we feasted and we lay a bask in the sunshine of a jolly idle life all these luxurious months drinking scorn and confusion amid our nightly flagons to remote care and as it seemed remoter normans but first to tell you how i won the right to lord it over these merry saxon churls and dissolute thanes editha had hardly come to her home and dried in a day or two her weeping eyes when all the noble vagrants from yonder battle were up in arms to woo her never was maid so sued from morning till night there was no rest or peace from the uppermost bower looking over the fair english glades down into the thickets of nut and hazel the air reeked of love and petitions the mighty dane like a sick bear slept upon her curtain threshold and growled amorousness into her timid ear before the sun was up the welsh prince wooed her all her breakfast time and his tawny harper spent many a golden morning in outlining his noble patron's genealogy in faith ap tudor ap griffith ap morgan ap huge and i know not how many others it seemed all had a hand in the making of that paragon but editha blushed and said she feared one saxon girl was all too few for so many they besought her up and down night and morning full and empty to wed them the english princelings dogged her footsteps when she went afield and torquil and wulfhera those bandaged lovers were ready for her with sighs and plaintive proposals when she came flitting frightened and fearful home through the bracken how could this end but in one way for the defenceless girl she was sued so much and sued so hot that one day she came creeping like a hunted animal to the turret nut where i sat brooding my fortunes and timorous and shy begged me to help her i stood up and touched her yellow dishevelled hair and told her there was but one way and editha knew it as well as any one and had made her choice and slipped into my arms and was happy that was as noisy a wedding as ever had been in vorwood editha freed a hundred serfs and all day long the noise of files on their iron collars echoed through her halls she fed at the door every miscreant or beggar who could crawl or hobble there and remitted her taxes to a score of poorer villains in the hall such noisy revellers as the rejected suitors surely never were seen they began that wedding feast in the morning and it was not finished by night to me who had so lately supped amid the costly detail the magnificent and cultivated license of a patrician roman table these saxon rioters seemed scrambling hungry dogs where electra would taunt her haughtly courtiers over loaded tables which the art of three empires had furnished firing her cruel witty arrows of spite and arrogance from her rose-strewn couches these rough uncivil woodland peers but wallowed in their ceaseless flow of muddy ale gorged themselves to sleep with the gross flesh of their acorn-fed swine and sang such songs and told such tales as made even me indifferent to scowl upon them and wonder that their kinswoman and her handmaids could sit and seem on watting of their gross obscene and noisy revels and late that night blood was nearly spilt upon the oaken floor of vorwood the thanes had fairly pocketed their disappointment but now deep in drink and stuffed with food and courage they began to eye me and my thin-hid scorn askance and then presently like the mutter of a quick-coming storm came the whisper why should she fall to the stranger why why it flew round the tables like wildfire and half-emptied beakers were set down and untasted food stopped on its way to the mouth and then all on a sudden the drunken chiefs were on foot advancing to the upper table where i sat by editha's right hand 
their daggers agleam in the torchlight shining upon their red and angry faces as they came tumbling and shouting towards us death to the black-haired stranger Vorward for a saxon why should he win her tis not my fashion to let the foeman come far to seek me and i was up in an instant overturning the table with all its wines and meats and whipping out my sword i leapt into the middle of the rushy space before them why i shouted why you drunken norman beaten dogs why because by thor and odin by all the bones of hengist and his brother i can throw a straighter javelin and whirl a heavier sword and sit a fiercer steed than any of you why because my heart is stronger than any that ever beat under your dirty scullion doublets why because i scorn and spit upon and deride you it was braggart boasting but i noticed the saxons liked their talk of that complexion and in this case it was successful the princes stood hesitating and staring as i towered before them fiery and disdainful in the red gleaming banquet lights until presently the youngest there burst into a merry laugh to see them all thus at bay chewing the hilts of their angry daggers and each one waiting for his neighbour to prove himself the braver by dying first upon my weapon that laugh had hardly reached the ruddy oaken rafters overhead when it was joined by a score of others and in a moment those wilful saxon lordlings were all laughing and jerking back their steels and scrambling into their supper-places as if they had not broken their fast since morning and i were their mother's son deep were their flagons that night after the women had stolen away and idwell ap howl filled the hall with wild welsh harping that stirred my soul like a battle-call for it was in my dear british tongue and full of the colour light and the life that had illuminated the first page of my long pilgrimage and the saxon gleemen not to be outdone each sang the song that pleased him best and the welshman strove to drown them with his harping and the thanes sang all at once whatever songs were noisiest and most licentious mighty was the fire that roared up the open hearth-place deep was the breathing of vanquished warriors from under the tables red was the spilt wine upon the floor when presently they put me upon a trestle and bearing me round the hall in discordant triumph finally bore me away to the inner corridors and left me at a portal where i had never yet entered there is but little to say of that quiet saxon rest that befell me in pleasant voorwood between each line i pen you must suppose an episode of pleasure in the springtime when the woods were shot with a carpet of blue and yellow flowers we lay a basking in the sunny angles or rode out to count our swine and fallow deer in the summer when all editha's mighty woodlands were like fair endless colonnades we basked among the flickering shadows and watched the sunny sheen upon the tree-tops to the orchestra of little birds and autumn that touched the vassal's corn clearings with yellow saw my proud norman charger grow fat and gross with new grain september rains and mists rusted my silent weapon into its sheath even winter that heard the woodman's axe upon the forest trees and saw bird and beast and men and kine draw in to the gentle bounty of my white-handed lady was but a long inglorious holiday of another sort many and many a time in those merry months did this phoenician laugh to his mirror to see how fitly he could wear upon his eastern british roman body the danish saxon english tunic it was all of fine linen the franklin's own fair fingers had spun and pointed and tasselled and party-colour and his legs were cross-gartered to his knees and his little luncheon dagger hung by his jewelled belt and a fillet of pure english gold bound down the long black locks that fell upon his shoulders every morning editha combed them out with her silver comb and double peaked his beard kissing and saying that it was the best in all vorwood he had more servants than necessities in those times and almost his only grievance was a lack of wants the normans for long had left us wholly alone 
partly through the usurper cunning which prompted our new tyrant to deal gently with those who had stood in arms against him but principally in our case since the strong tide of invasion had swept northward beyond us and vorward slept unharmed unnoticed among its green solitudes a saxon homestead as it had been since hengist's white horse first flaunted upon an english breeze and the seven kingdoms sprang from the ashes of old roman britain so we lived light-hearted from day to day forgetting all about the battle by senlac and drinking as i have said in our evening wassails confusion and scorn of the invaders who seemed so distant it was a good time and i have little to note of it many were the big boars which died upon my eager spear down in the morasses to the southward and i came to love my casts of tearslets and my hounds as though i had been born to a woodman's cape and had watched the fens for hernshaws and followed the slot of wounded deers from my youth upwards all these things led me into many a wild adventure and many a desperate strait but one of them stands out from the rest upon the crowded pages of my memory i had one day when editha was with me mounted as she would be upon her palfrey slipped the dogs upon a stag an arrow of mine had wounded in the foreleg and excited by the chase and reluctant as ever to turn back from an unaccomplished purpose we followed far into the unknown distances and all beyond our reckonings i had let fly that shaft at midday and at sundown the stag was still afoot the dogs close behind him and i indomitable muddy and torn from head to foot but with all the hunter instinct hot within me was pressing on by my saxon's bridle rein endless rough and tangled miles had we run and scrambled in that lengthy chase and neither of us had noticed the way or how angry the sun was setting in the west thus it came about that when the noble heart at length stood at bay in the lich and coverts under a bushy crag there was hardly breath in me to cheer the weary dogs upon him and hardly light enough to aim the swift thrust of my subduing javelin which laid him dead and bleeding at our feet yes and before i could cut a hunter's supper from that glossy haunch the dome of the sky closed down from east to west and the first heavy drops of the evening rain came pattering upon the leaves overhead thor how black it grew as the wind began to whistle through the branches and the murky clouds to fly across the face of the sombre heaven while neither east nor west could any limit be seen to the interminable vastnesses of the endless woodlands in vain was it we struggled for a time back upon our footsteps and then even those were lost and as the sky in the east burnt an angry yellow for a moment before the remorseless night set in it gave us just light to see we were hopelessly mazed in the labyrinths of the huge and lonely forest it was thus we turned to take such shelter as might offer and that gleam shone for a moment pallid yellow and ghastly upon a cluster of grey stones standing on a grassy mound a quarter of a mile away thither we struggled through the black mazes of the storm the headlong rain whistling through the misty thickets like flights of innumerable arrows the angry wind lashing the tree-tops into bitter complaining and waving abroad in the sodden dismal twilight all the long beards of goblin lichens hanging in ghostly tapestry across our path that dreary october evening reeling and plunging to the shelter through a black world of tangled witnesses with that mocking gleam behind shining like a window of the nether-world and overhead a gaunt hurrying array of cloudy forms we were presently upon the coppice outskirt and there i stopped as though i had grown to the ground i stopped before that great gaunt amphitheatre of grey stones and stared and stared before me as though i were bereft of sense i rubbed my eyes and pointed with trembling silent finger and looked again and again while the saxon girl crouched to my side and my hounds whined and shivered at my feet for there incredible monstrous yellow and shining in the pallid derision of the twilight stern hoary ruinous mocking 
overthrown and piled one upon another clasped about their feet by the knotted fingers of the woodland growth swathed in the rocking mists which gave a horrid life to their cruel infernal deadness were the stones the very stones of the druid altar-place upon which i was sacrificed nearly a thousand years before here was a pretty welcome here was a cheerful harbourage what man ever born of a woman who would not have been dazed and dumbfounded at this sudden confronting this extraordinary reminiscence of the long-forgotten it overwhelmed for the moment even me me fra the phoenician to whom the red harvest fields of war are pleasant places who have dallied with the infinite and have been a melancholy coadjutor of time itself even me who never sought to live yet live endlessly by my very negligence who have received from the gods that gift of existence that others ask for unanswered i might have stood there as stolid and grim as any one of those ancient monoliths all through the storm but for the dear one by my side her nestling presence roused me and gulping down the last of my astonishment and seeing no respite in the yellow eye of the night over my shoulder i took the hand that lay in mine with such gentle trust and with a strange feeling of awe led her into the magic circle of the old religion the very altar of my dispatch was still there in the centre but time and forest creatures had worn out from under that mighty slab a little chamber roofed with that vast flagstone and sided by its three supports a space perhaps no bigger than the cabin of my first trading for Luca. yet into this we crept with the reluctant hounds behind us while the tempest thundered round and loath to lose us sought here and there piping in strange keys among those time-worn relics of cruelty and singing uncouth choruses down every crevice of our wild retreat pleasure and pain are sisters and the little needs of life must be fulfilled in every hour i comforted my comrade piling for her a rough couch of the broken litter upon the floor stuffing up the crannies as well as might be with damp sods and then making her a fire this latter i effected with some charcoal and burnt ends of wood that lay upon an old shepherd's hearth in the centre of the chamber and we kept it going with a little store of wood which the same absent wanderer had gathered in one corner but had failed to use more not only did we mend our circumstances by a ruddy blaze that danced fantastically upon our rugged walls and set our reeking clothes steaming in its flicker but i rolled a stone to the opposite side of the hearth for editha and found another for myself and soon those venison steaks were hissing most invitingly upon the glowing embers and filling every nook and corner of the druid slaughter-place with the suggestive fragrance of our supper manners were rude and ready in that time we supped as well and conveniently that night carving the meat with the little weapons at our girdles and eating with our fingers as though we sat in state at the high thane's table of distant forewood and looked down the great rushy hall upon three hundred feeding serfs and bondsmen and editha laughed and chattered secure in my protection and i echoed her merriment while now and then my thoughts would wander and i heard again in the tempest whistling the scream of the hungry kites who had seen me die and in the lashing of the branches the clamour and the beating of the british tribesmen who many a long lifetime before had shouted around this very place to drown my dying yells the good food and warmth and a long day's work soon brought my fair mistress's head upon her hand and presently she was lying upon the withered leaves in the corner a fair white flower shut up for the night-time so i finished the steak and divided the remnants between the dogs and lay back very well contented but here only commences the strangest part of that evening i had warmed my cross-gartered buskined saxon legs by the blaze for the best part of an hour thinking over all the strange episodes of my coming to these ancient isles and seeing again on the blank hither wall this very circle all aglow with the splendid colour of its barbarous purpose the mighty concourse of the britons set in the greenery of their reverend oaks 
the onset of the roman the flash and glitter of their close-packed ranks and the gallant sempronius alas that so good a youth should be reduced to dust and thus i suppose i dozed and then it seemed all on a sudden a mighty gust of wind swept down upon the flat roof overhead shaking even that ponderous stone those fierce and brawny hounds of mine howled most fearfully crouching behind with bristling hair and shaking limbs and looking up there strange incredible as you will pronounce it seated beyond the fire on the stone the saxon had so lately left drawing her wild rain-wet british tresses through her supple fingers calm indifferent happy gazing upon me with the gentle wonder i had seen before was blodwyn once again herself need it be said how wild and wonderful that winsome apparition seemed in that uncouth place how the hot flush of wonder burnt upon my swart and weathered cheeks as i sat there and glared through the leaping flame at that pallid outline absently she went on with her rhythmical combing bewitching me with her unearthly grace and the tender substance of her immaterial outline and as i glowered with never a ready syllable upon my idle tongue or any emotion but wonder in the heart beating tumultuously under my hunter tunic the dogs lay moaning behind me and the wild fantastic uproar of the tempest outside forced through the clefts of our retreat the rain-streaks that sparkled and hissed in the fire-heap that time i did not fear and presently the princess looked up and said in a faint distant voice that was like the sound of the breeze among seashore pine-trees well done my phoenician your courage gives me strength and as she spoke the words seemed gradually clearer and stronger until presently they came sweeter to me than the murmur of a sunny river gentler than the whispers of the ripe corn and the south wind shade i said wonderful immaterial immortal whence came you whence did i come she answered with the pretty reflection of a smile upon her face out of the storm o son of anak out of the wild wet night wind and why and why to stir me to my inmost soul and then to leave me phoenician she said i have not left you since we parted i have been the unseen companion of your goings i have been the shadowless watcher by your sleep mine was the unfelt hand that bore your chin up when you swam with the christian slave-girl mine was the arm that has turned invisibly a hundred javelins from you and to-night i am come by leave of circumstance thus to see you i should have thought i said becoming now better at my ease that one like you might come or go in scorn of circumstance wherein my dear master you argue with more simplicity than knowledge there are needs and necessities to the very verge of the spheres but when i questioned what these were asking the secret of her wayward visits she looked at the sleeping editha and said i could not understand yes by wodin's self but i think i can yon fair-cheeked girl helps you there are a hundred turns and touches in your ways and manners that speak of her and show whence you got that borrowed life you are astute my saxon thane and i will not utterly refute you then if you can do this how was it blodwyn you never came when i was roman in truth i often tried she said with something like a sigh but numidia was not good to fit my subtle needs and the other one electra was all beyond me and here that versatile shadow threw herself into an attitude and there before me was the roman lady so sweet so enticing that my heart yearned for her ah for the queenly electra all in a moment but before i could stretch out my arms the airy form had whisked her ethereal draperies toga-wise across her breast and had risen and there towering to the low roof flashing down scorn and hatred on me quaking at her feet shone the very semblance of electra as i saw her last in the queenly glamour of her vengeance yes said blodwyn resuming her own form with perfect calmness before i astounded could catch my breath 
and stroking out the tangles of her long red hair there was no doing anything with her and so phoenician i could not get translated to your material eyes all this was very wonderful yet presently we were chatting as though there were naught to marvel at many were the things we spoke of many were the wonders that she hinted at and as she went my curiosity blazed up apace and fair princess i said presently turner of javelins favourer of mortals is it then within the power of such as yourself to rule the destiny of us material ones not so else phoenician you were not here this made me a little uncomfortable but nothing daunted i looked the strangest visitor that ever paid a midnight visit full in the face and persisted tell me then you bright reflection of her i loved how seems this tinsel show of life upon its overside is it destiny or man that is master how looks the flow of circumstances to you to us you will remember it is vague inexplicable you ask me more than i can say she answered but so far i will go you material live substantially and before you lies unchecked the illimitable spaces of existence of all these you are certain heir speak on i cried for now and then her voice and attention flagged and is there any rule or sequence in this life of ours is it for you to guide or mend our happenings no phoenician you are yourselves the true forgers of the chains that bind you and that initial prenticeship you serve there on your world is ruled by the aggregate of your actions i tell you tyrian she exclaimed with something as much like warmth as could come from such a hazy air-stirred body i tell you nothing was ever said or done but was quite immortal all your little goings and comings all your deeds and misdeeds all the myriad leaves of spoken things that have ever come upon the forests of speech all the raindrops of action that have gone to make the boundless ocean of human history are on record you shake your head and cannot understand perhaps i should not wonder at it and have all these things left a record upon the great books of life and is it given to the beings of the air to refer to them even as yonder hermit turns back his scrolls of history and finds secreted on his yellow vellums the things of long ago it is so in some kind the actions of that life of yours leave spirit prints behind them from the most infinitesimal to the largest now see i have but to wish and there again is all the moving pantomime around you of that unhappy day when you well nigh died upon this spot and the chieftainess leapt to her feet and swept her arm around and looked into the void and smiled and nodded as though all the wild spectacle she spoke of were enacting under her very eyes surely you see it look at the priests and the people and there the running foreigners and that tall youth at their head why o oh, trader in oils and dyes it is not the remembrance of the thing it is i swear it the thing itself but never a line or colour could i perceive only the curling smoke overhead looped and hung like tapestries upon the grey lichened walls and the black night-time through the crevices and discovering this blodwyn suddenly stopped and looked upon me with vexed compassion i am sorry i am no good teacher to so outrun my pupil ask me henceforth what simple questions you will and they shall be answered to the best i can and so presently i went on if those things which have been are thus to you and it does not seem impossible how is it with those other things of to-day or still unborn of the future how far can you more favoured ones foresee or guide these things to which we unhappy but submit the strong tide of circumstance phoenician is not to be turned by such hands as these and she held her pallid wrists towards the blaze until i saw the ruddy gleam flash back from the rough gold bosses of her ancient bracelets there are laws outside your comprehension which are not framed for your narrow understanding we obey these as much as you but we perceive with infinitely clearer vision the inevitable logic of fate the true sequence of events and thus it is sometimes within our power to amend and guide the details of that brief episode which you call your life 
do you say that priceless span my comrades yonder sleeping girl and all the others set so high a value on is but an episode yes a halting step upon a wondrous journey half a gradation upon the mighty spirals of existence and time i asked full of a wonder that scarce found leisure to comprehend one word of hers before it asked another question is there time with you even i reflective now and then upon this long journey of mine have thought that time must be a myth an impossibility to larger experience of what do you speak my merchant i do not remember the word oh yes but you must is there period and change yonder is time time the great braggart and bully of life all so potent with you ah now i do recall your meaning but my tyrian we left our hourglasses and our calendars behind us when we came away there is perhaps time yonder to some extent but no mortal eyes not mine even can tell the teaching of that prodigious dial that records the hours of universes and of spaces i bent my head and thought for i dimly perceived in all this a meaning appearing through its incomprehensibleness much else did we talk through the livelong night whereof all i may not tell and something might but weary you at one time i asked her of the little one i had never seen and then she reflective questioned whether i would wish to see him as gladly was my reply as one looks for the sun in springtime at this the comely chieftainess seemed to fall amusing and even when she did so an eddy in the curling smoke of the low red fire swang gently into consistency there by her bare shoulder and brightened and grew into mortal likeness and in a moment by the summons of his mother's will from where i knew not and how i could not guess a fair young ruddy boy was fashioned and stood there leaning upon the gentle breast that had so often rocked him and gazing upon me with a quiet wonder that seemed to say how came you here but the little one had not the substance of the other and after a moment during which i felt somehow that no slight effort was being made to maintain him he paled and then the same waft of air that had conspired to his creation shredded him out again into the fine thin webs of disappearing haze comely shadow dear british mistress great was thy condescension passing strange thy conversation wonderful thy knowledge perplexing mysterious thy professed ignorance and then when the morning was nigh she bade me speak a word of comfort to the restless sleeping editha and when i had done so i turned again and the cave was empty i ran out into the open air and whispered blodwin and then louder blodwin and all those grey uncouth sinful old monoliths standing there in the half light up to their waists in white mist took up my word and muttered out of their time-worn hollows one to another blodwin blodwin but never again for many a long year did she answer to that call End of chapter six chapter seven of the wonderful adventures of fra the phoenician by edwin lester arnold this librivox recording is in the public domain in the days that followed it seemed the cruise of contentment would never run dry and i foolish i thought angry destiny had misled me and that these green saxon glades were to witness the final ending of my story vain hope elusive expectation the hand of fate was even then raised to strike in that pleasant harbourage outside the ken of ambition and beyond the limits of avarice surrounded by almost impenetrable mazes of forest land life was delightful indeed the sun shone yellow and big in those early days upon our oak-crowned hillocks sometimes i doubt if it is ever so warm and ruddy now and december storms told mightily in praise of the great yule fires wherewith we defied the winter cold in the summer time when the sunny saxon orchards sheltered the herds of kine in their flickering shadows 
and the great droves of black swine lay a-basking among the ferns on the distant hangers we lived more out of doors than in editha then would bring out under the oaks the little ruddy-cheeked girth and set him upon my knee that i might cut him reed whistles or bows and arrows while the flaxen-haired agitha played about her mother tuning her pretty prattle to the merry clatter of the distaff and the wheel in the winter the blaze that went leaping and crackling from our hearthstone shone golden upon the hair of those little ones as they sat wide-eyed by me and saw among the ruddy embers the white horse of hengist and the banner of his brother winning those fertile vales for a noble saxon realm never was there a better saxon than i and when i told of harold and softened to those tender ears the story of his dying the bright drops of sympathy stood in my small maiden's eyes while girths flashed hatred of the false norman and scorn of the foreign tyrants under such circumstances it will readily be understood that i ought to have had little wish to draw weapons again or bestride the good charger growing so gross and sleek in his stall all this long peace time and yet the silken meshes of felicity were irksome against all reason and i would grow weary of so much good fortune finding my pretty deckings and raiment heavier more burdensome wear than ever was martial harness my fair saxon wife noted these moods and strove to mend them she would take me out to the hawking were i never so gloomy and then i would envy the wild haggards of the rocks who got their living from day to day in the free mid-air and ask no favour of either gods or men or perhaps she would make revelries upon the level green before her homestead and thither would come all the fools and peddlers all the bear-baiters somersaulters and wrestlers of the shire but i was not to be pleasured so and i slew the bear in single combat and tossed vindictive the somersaulters over the huckster's stalls and broke the ribs in the restless sides till none would play with me and all the people murmured then of a night editha got the best gleeman in mercia to sing to me and when they sang of peace and sheep and orchards or each praised his lemon's moonlike eyes and slender middles i would not listen nor was it better when they tuned their strings to martial ditties for that doubled my malady since then their rhyming stirred my soul to new unrest making worse that which they sought to cure i sometimes think it was all this to do which brought vorwood under norman notice but perhaps it was the slow and steady advance of the invader's power percolating like a rising tide into all the recesses of the land which drew us into the fatal circle of the despoilers and not my waywardness be this as it may the result was the same over to the northward a score of miles away where the great road ran east we heard from wandering strollers the normans were passing daily then later there came in the news budget of a flemish peddler tidings that the hungry foreigners had licked up all the fat meadows around the nearest town had hung its aldermen over the walls and built a tower and dungeon after their wont in the middle of it yes and these messengers of ill omen said there were left no men of note or saxon blood to uphold the english cause there was no proper speech in england but the norman there was no way of wearing a tunic but the norman nothing now to swear by but our lady of tor and holy saint bridget all saxon wives were in danger of kissing and all saxon abbots were become barefooted monks never was a country turned inside out so soon or quietly and as i looked over our wide fair meadows and upon my sweet girl and her flaxen little ones and thought how already for her i had risked my life i could not help wondering how soon i might have to venture it again on a pace came the outer conquest into our inner peace towns and boroughs went down and the hungry flames of lust and avarice fed upon what they destroyed all the vales and hills the swords of hengist and horsa had won and baptized with foemen's blood in the mighty names of old norsemen and valhalla were being christened anew to suit a mincing latter tongue thane and franklin uncapped them at the roadside to these steel-bound swarms of ruthless spoilers and nothing was sacred neither deed nor covenant 
neither having nor holding which ran counter to the wishes of the western scourges of our english weakness when i thought of all this i was extraordinarily ill at ease and before i could settle upon how best to meet the danger it came upon us and we were overwhelmed briefly it was thus about twelve years after the battle where harold had died the norman leader had we heard taken it into his head to pole us like cattle to find the sum and total of our feus and lands our serfs and orchards and even of our very selves now few of us saxons but felt this was a certain scheme to tax and oppress us even more severely than the people had been oppressed in the time of st dunstan besides this our free spirits rose in scorn of being counted and weighed and mulcted by plebeian emissaries of the usurper so we murmured loud and long and those thanes who complained the bitterest were hanged by the derisive normans on their own kitchen beams on the very same hooks where they cured their mighty sides of pork while those who complied but falsely with the assessor's commands were robbed of wife and heritage children and lands and shackled with the brass collar of serfdom or turned out to beg their living on the wayside and sue the charity of their own dependents whether we would thus be hanged or outcast or whether we would humble us to this hateful need writing ourselves and our serfs down in the great doomsday book all had to choose for my part after much debating and for the sake of those who looked to me i had determined to do what was required and then if it might be to bring all the saxon gentlemen together to raise these english shires upon the normans and with fire and sword revoke our abominable indenture of thraldom but alas my hasty temper and my inability to stomach an affront in any guise undid my good resolutions well this mighty book was being compiled far and wide we heard in every shire there were some men of good standing base enough to countenance it and taking the name of the king's justiciaries they got together shorn monks shaveling rascals who did the writing and computing with reeves hungry for their master's woodlands and many other lean forsworn villains this jury of miscreants went round from hall to hall from manor to manor with their scrips and pens and parchment until all the land was being gathered into the avaricious norman's tax-roll they cast their greedy eyes at last on sunny sleepy vorward though indeed i had implored every deity old or new i could recall that they might overlook it and one day their hireling train of two-score pikemen came ambling down the glades with a fat abbot a norman rascal at their head and pulled up at our doorway hullo there says the monk whose house is this mine i said gruffly with a secret fancy that there would be some heads broken before the census was completed and who are you the master of vorwood what else nothing else well you are not over civil anyhow my saxon churl said the man of scrolls and goose quills frankly i answered sir monk the smaller civility you look for from me to-day the less likely you are to be disappointed out with that infernal catechism of yours and have done and move your black shadows from my porch at this the clerk shrugged his shoulders no doubt he did not look to be a very welcome guest and coughed and spit and then unfurled in our free sunshine a great roll of questions and forthwith proceeded to expound them in bastard latin smacking of mouldy cathedral cells and cloister pedantry now mark me sir vorward and afterwards answer truly in everything here first i will read you the declaration of your neighbour the worthy thane suin in order that you may see how the matter should go and then afterwards i will question you yourself and taking a parchment from a junior he began here is what suin told us rex tenet in dominio sohurst de firma regis eduardi fuit tunc se defendebat pro septem desin hidis nihil geldavarunt terra est se decim carucatai in dominio sunt duai carucatai et viginti et quatuor vilani et decem bodarij convigenti carucis ibi ecclesia quam velemus 
tenet di regge cum dimidia hida in elemosina silva quadragenta porcorum et ipsa est in parco regis but hardly had my friend got so far as this in displaying the domesticity of suin the thane when there broke a loud uproar from the rear of vorward and the tripping latin came to a sudden halt as there emerged in sight a rabble of saxon peasants and norman prickers freely exchanging buffets in the midst of them was our bailiff a very stalwart fellow hauling along and beating as he came a luckless soldier in the foreign garb just then so detestable to our eyes why i said what may all this be about what has the fellow done sven that your saxon cudgel makes such friends with his norman cape what why the graceless yonker not content with bursting open the buttery door and setting all those scullion men at arms drinking my lady's ale and rioting among her stores must needs harry the maidens scaring them out of their wits and putting the whole place in an uproar as i am an honest man there has been more good ale spilt this half hour more pottery broken more linen torn more roasts upset more maids set screaming than since the danes last came round this way and pillaged us from roof to cellar why you fat saxon porker cried the leader of the troops pushing to the front what are you good for but for pillage drunken serf and it were not for the politic heart of yonder king i and mine would make you and yours sigh again for your danish ravishers looking back from our mastery to their red fury with sickly longing out on you unhand the youth or by saint bridget there will be a fat carcass for your crows to peck at and he put his hand upon his dagger thereon i stepped between them and touching my jewelled belt said fair sir i think the youth has had no less than his deserts and as for the vorward crows they like norman carrion even better than saxon flesh the soldier frowned as well as he might at my retort but before we could draw as assuredly we would have done the monk pushed in between us and the athelings of the commission who had orders to carry out their work with peace and dispatch as long as that were possible quieted their unruly rabble and presently a muttering surly order was restored between the glowering crowds now said the scribe propitiatingly anxious to get through with his task you have heard how amiably suin answered of you i will ask a question or two in saxon since likely enough you do not know the blessed latin by the soul of hengist though i knew it before the stones of that confessor's ancient monastery were hewn from their native rock answer truly and all shall be well with you first then how much land hast thou but i could not stand it my spleen was roused against these braggart bullies and throwing discretion to the wind i burst out just so much as serves to keep me and mine in summer and winter and how many ploughs so many as need to till our cornlands rude boar said the monk backing off into the group of his friends and frowning from that vantage in his turn how many serfs acknowledge your surly leadership just so many i said boiling over as can work the ploughs and reap the corn and keep the land from greedy foreign clutches there put up your scroll and be gone i will not answer you i will not say how many pigeons there are in our dovecots how many fowls roost upon their perches how many earthen pots we have or how many maids to scrub them get you back to the conqueror tell him i deride and laugh at him for the second time say i have lived a longish life and i never yet saw the light of that day when i profited by humility say i the swart stranger who stabbed his ruffian courtier and galloped away with the white maid editha of vorwood i who plucked that flower from the very saddle-bow of his favourite and thundered derisive through his first camp there on the eastern downs say even i will find a way to keep and wear her in scorn of all that he can do out with you be gone and they went for i was clearly in no mood to be dallied with while behind me the serfs and vassals were now mustering strongly an angry array armed with such weapons as they could snatch up in their haste and wanting but a word or look to fall upon the little band of assessors and slay them as they stood thus we won that hour and many a long day had we to regret the victory my luck was against me that time 
i hoped so far as there was any hope or reason in my thoughtless anger to have had a space to rouse the neighbouring thanes and their vassals upon these our tyrants and i had dreamt so combustible was the country just then somehow perhaps the flame would have spread far and wide i saw that abominable thing rebellion for once linked hand in hand with her sweet rival patriotism i saw the red flames of vengeance in the quarrel i had made my own sweeping through the land and lapping up with its hundred tongues every evidence of the spoilers yes and even i had fancied that and there were no true saxon princes for our english throne there was still editha my wife and if there were no swords left to fence a throne so filled yet there was the sword of fra the phoenician vain fantasy the faces of the fates were averted those hateful inquisitors had not gone many hours journey northward when as ill luck would have it they fell in with a norman captain godfrey de boville and two hundred men-at-arms marching to garrison a western city to these they told their tale and ever ready for pillage and bloodshed the band halted and then turned into the woodlands where we had our lair the sun was low that afternoon when an affrighted herdsman came running into me with the news that he knew not how many soldiers were in the glades beyond and before he could get his breath or quite tell his hasty message their prickers came out of the wood the gallant norman array whose glitter has since grown dearer to me than the shine of a mistress's eyes rode from under our oak trees the banners and bannerets fluttered upon the evening wind their trumpets brayed until our very rafters echoed to that warlike sound the level twilight rays flashed back from those serried ranks and the steel panoply of the warriors in as goodly a martial show as ever to that day i had seen what need i tell you of the negotiations which followed while this silver cloud charged with ruin and cruelty hung on the dusky velvet side of the twilight hill above us what need be said of how i swore between my teeth at the chance which had brought this swarm hither in a day rather than in the week i had hoped for or how my heart burned with smothered anger and pride when we had to tamely answer their haughty summons to unconditional surrender yet by one saving clause they did not attack us at once only to me was it clear how utterly impossible was it with the few rugged serfs at my command to defend even for one single onset that great straggling house against their overwhelming force to them our strength was quite unknown this and the gathering darkness tempted the norman to put off the attack until the daylight came again and the respite was our saving it was not a saving upon which i wished to dwell long for twas no more glorious than the retreat of a wolf from his hiding-place when the shepherds fire the brake behind him all along the edge of the hill their watch-fires presently twinkled out and as editha and sven the strong came to me in gloomy conference upon the turret we could see the soldiers pass now and again before the blaze we could hear their laughter and the snatches of their drinking song the hoarse cry of the wardens and the champing and whinny of the chargers picketed under the starlight in lines upon our free saxon turf and for sven and all his good comrade hinds we knew to-morrow would bring the riveting of new and heavier collars than any they had worn as yet for me and my contumacy though i feared it not there could be naught but the swift absolution of a norman sword while for her for her that gentle stately lady to whose pale sweetness my rough unworthy pen can do no sort of justice there was nameless degradation and half a wandering bully's tent the serf suggested with his rugged northern valour we should set light to the hall and with the women and children in our midst sally out and cut away to freedom and i knew the path he would choose would have been through the hostile camp but his lady suggested better she proposed both hind and bondsman should steal away in the darkness and since valour here was hopeless disperse over the countryside and there secure in their humbleness await our future returning we on the other hand would follow them through the friendly shadows that lay deep and nigh to the house on the unguarded side and then turn us to a monastery some few miles away where if we could reach it in sanctuary and the care of one of the few remaining saxon abbots 
we might bide our chance or at least make terms with our conquerors so it was settled and soon i had all those kind shaggy villains in the dining hall standing there uncapped upon the rushes in the torchlight and listening in melancholy silence to the plan and then presently with the dispatch our situation needed they were slipping in twos and threes out of the little rearward portal and slinking off to the thickets presently our turn came and as i stood gloomy and stern in that voiceless empty hall that was wont to be so bright and noisy fingering my itching dagger and scowling out of the lattice upon the red gleam in the night air hanging over the norman campfires there came the fall of my wife's feet upon the stairway in either hand she had a babe swaddled close up against the night air and naught but their bright wonder-brimming eyes showing as she hugged them tight against her sides for them for them alone the frown gave way and i stooped to that escape we crept away and editha's heart was torn at leaving thus the hall where she had been born and reared and when presently in the shadows of the crowded oaks she found all her slaves and bondsmen in a knot to wish her farewell the tears that had been brooding long overflowed unrestrainedly even i who had dwelt among them but a space on my way from the further world of history towards the unknown future could not but be moved by their uncouth love and loyalty there were men there who had stood in arms with her father when the cruel danes had ravished these valleys for a score of miles inland and some who had grown with her in the goodly love and faith of thane and servitor as long as she herself had lived these rugged fellows wept like children called me father clafod bread bestower and pressed upon her in silent sorrow kissing her hands and the hem of her robe and taking the little ones from her arms and pressing their rude unshaven faces to their rosebud cheeks until i feared that girth or agatha might cry out or some wail from that secret scene of sorrow would catch the ears of our watchful foemen so as gently as might be i parted the weeping mistress and her bondsman and set her upon a good horse sven had stolen from the paddock and springing into the saddle of my own strong charger gave my broad jewelled belt to the saxon that he might divide it among his comrades and taking a long tough spear from his faithful hand turned northward with editha upon our dangerous journey we stole along as quietly as might be for some distance in safety riding where the moss was deepest and the shadows thick and then just when we were at the nearest to the norman camp in the curve we were making towards the monastery beyond those ill-conditioned invaders set up their evening trumpet call as the shrill notes came down into the dim starlight glade strong clear and martial in the evening quiet they thrilled that gallant old charger i had borrowed from the camp at hastings down to his inmost warlike fibre he recognised the familiar sound mayhap it was the very trumpet call which had been fodder and stable to him for years and with ears pricked forward and feet that beat the dewy turf in union to his pleasure he whinnied loud and long nothing it availed me to smite my hand upon my breast at this deadly betrayal or lay a warning finger upon his brave unwitting velvet nozzle luckless accursed horse the mischief was done but yet i will not abuse him for the grass grows green over his strong sleek limbs and right well that night he amended his error hardly had his neigh gone into the stillness when the charges in the camp answered it and in a moment the men-at-arms and squires by the nearest fire were all on foot and in another they had espied us and set up a shout that woke the ready camp in a moment there was small time to think i clapped my hand upon editha's bridle rein and gave my own a shake and away we went across the chequered moonlight glade but so close had we been that a bowstring or two hummed in the norman tents and before we were fairly started i heard the rustle of the shafts in the leaves overhead it was more than arrows we had to dread and turning my head for a moment ere we plunged again into the dark vistas of the forest road there sure enough was the pursuit streaming out after us and gallant squires and knights tumbling into their saddles and shouting and cheering as they came galloping and glittering down behind us 
a very pretty show but a dangerous one by the souls of st dunstan and his forty monks but i could have enjoyed that midnight ride had it not been for the pale brave rider at my side and the little ones that lay fearfully a-nestling on our saddle-bows for hours the swift keen gallop of our horses swallowed the unseen ground in tireless rhythm all through the night field and coppice and hangar swept by us as we passed from glade to glade and woodland to woodland now it was a lonely forester's hut that shone for a moment in ghostly whiteness between the tree stems with the nightshine on its lifeless face and anon we sped through droves of saxon swine sleeping upon the roadway under their oak trees round a muffled swineherd and the great forest stags stayed the fraying of their antlers against the tree trunks in the dark coppices as we flew by and the startled wolf yelped and snarled upon our path as our fleeting shadows o'ertook him and then there ever behind low remorseless stern came the murmuring hoof-beats of our pursuers now rising and now falling upon the light breath of the night wind but ever as our panting steed strode shorter and shorter coming nearer and nearer clearer and clearer had this sombre race whereof death held the stakes continued so as it began straight on end i do not think we could have got away but when we had ridden many an hour and the heavy streaks of white foam were marking editha's horse with dreadful suggestion and his breath was coming hot and husky through his wide red nostrils for a moment or two the sound of the pursuers stopped blessed respite they had missed the woodland road but for all too short a space we had hardly made good four or five hundred yards of advantage when terribly near to us sounded the call of one of their horsemen and soon all the others were in his footsteps again this one he who now led the pursuers by perhaps a quarter of a mile gained on us stride by stride until i could stand the thud of his horse hoofs on the turf behind no more here i said fiercely to editha take girth and put him with his sister in her arms then bidding them ride slowly forward turned my good charger and paced him slowly back towards the oncoming night with stern anger smouldering in my heart there was a smooth wide bit of grassy road between us in that centre midnight saxon forest and never a gleam of light fell upon that ancient thoroughfare never the faintest thin white finger of a star pierced the black canopy of boughs overhead it was as black as the kennel of cerberus and as i sat my panting war-horse i could not see my own hand stretched out before me yet there in that grim blackness i met the norman lance to lance and sent his spirit whirling into the outer space i let him come within two hundred yards then suddenly rose in my stirrups and shouting harold's war-cry since i did not deign to fall upon him unawares out out england england awaited his answer it came in a moment strange and inhuman in the black stillness ro a ro notre dame and then muttering between my tight-set teeth that surely that road was the road to hell for one of us i bent my head down almost to my horse's ears drove the spurs into him and gripping my long keen spear thundered back upon my unseen foeman with a shock that startled the browsing hinds a mile away we were together the norman spear broke into splinters athwart my body but mine more truly held struck him fair and full i felt him like a great dead weight upon it i felt his saddle girths burst and fly and then as my own strong haft bent like a willow wand and snapped close by my hand that midnight rider and his visionary steed went crashing to the ground bitterly i laughed as i turned my horse northwards once more and from a black cavern mouth on the hillside an owl echoed my grim merriment with ghastly glee well the night was all but done yet we were not out of the toils a little further on editha's floundering steed gave out and just as we saw the pale turrets of the monastery shining in the open a mile ahead of us the horse rolled over dead upon the grass and bracken quick quick i said daughter of hardy canute 
and the good saxon girl had passed the little ones to the pummel and put her own foot upon my toe and sprang on to my saddle crupper sooner than it takes to tell ah and the nearer we came to our goal the closer seemed to be the throb and beat of the pursuing hoofs behind and many an anxious time did i turn my head to watch the rogues closing with us now ever and anon in sight and many a word of encouragement did i whisper to the gallant charger whose tireless courage was standing us in such good case noble beast right well had he atoned his mistake that evening and in a few minutes more we left the greenwood and now he swept us over the abbot's fat meadows where the white morning mist was lying ghostly in wreaths and wisps upon the tall wet grass and then we staggered into the fosse and spurned the short turf and so passed the chequered cloisters and pulled up finally at a low postern door i had espied as we approached the nearest wall of the noble saxon monastery surely never was a traveller in such a hurry to be admitted as i and i beat upon that iron-studded door with the knob of my dagger in a way which must have been heard in every cell of that sacred pile my friend said a reverend head which soon appeared at a little window above is this not unseemly haste at such an hour and my lord abbot not yet risen to matins for the love of heaven father i said come down and let us in for by this time the normans were not a bow-shot away and it still looked as if we might fall into their hands why said the unwotting monk no doubt the hospitality of st olaf's walls was never yet refused to weary strangers but you must go round to the lodge and rouse the porter there truly he sleeps a little heavy but no doubt he will admit you eventually sir priest i shouted in my rage and fear as the good old fellow went meandering on our need is past all nicety of etiquette here is editha of vorwood the niece of your holy abbot himself and yonder are they who would harry and take her come down come down or by the holy rood our blood will for ever stain your ungenerous lintel by this time the horsemen were breasting the smooth green glacis that led up to the monastery walls half a dozen of them had outlived that wild race the reins were upon their smoking chargers necks their reeking spurs red and ruddy with their haste the spattered clay and loam of many a woodland rivulet chequering their horses to the shoulders and each rider as he came shouting and clapping his hands upon the foam-speckled neck of these panting steeds that strained with thundering feet to the last hundred yards of green sward and the prize beyond nearer and nearer they came and my fair tall saxon wife put down her little ones by the opening of the door and covered them with her skirt as she turned her pale white tearless face to the primrose flush of the morning and i with bitterness and despair in my heart unsheathed my saxon sword and cast the scabbard fiercely to the ground and stood out before them my bare and heaving breast a fair target for those glistening oncoming norman lances and then just when that game was all but lost there came the sweet patter of sandalled feet within bolt by bolt was drawn back willing hands were stretched out the mother and her babes were dragged from the steps even my charger was swallowed by the friendly shelter and i myself was pulled back lastly the postern slammed to and as the great locks turned again and the iron bars fell into their stony sockets we heard the norman chargers hoofs ringing on the flagstones and the angry spearheads rattling on the outer studs of that friendly oaken doorway thus was the gentle franklin saved but little did i think in saving her how long i was to lose her i had but stabled my noble beast down by the abbot's own palfrey and fed and watered him with loving gratitude and then had gone to editha and my own supper waited on by many a wondering kindly one of those corded russet brothers when that strange fate of mine overtook me once again i know not how it was but all on a sudden the world melted away into a shadowy fantasy my head sank upon the supper-board and there between the goodly abbot and the fair saxon lady i fell into a pleasant dreamless sleep End of chapter seven
Chapter Eight of the Wonderful Adventures of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was with indescribable sensations of mingled pain and satisfaction that life dawned again in my mind and body after the drowsy ending of the last chapter. To me, the process was robbed of wonder. No idea crossed my mind but that I had slept an ordinary sleep but to you knowing the strange fate to which i am liable will at once occur suspicion and expectation both these feelings will be gratified yet i must tell my story in my simple fashion as it occurred this time then wakefulness came upon me in a prolonged grey and crimson vision and for a long spell now i think of it closely probably for days I was wrestling to unravel a strange web of light and gloom, in which all sorts of dreamy colours shone alternate, in a misty blending, upon the blank field of my mind. These colours were now and again swallowed up by an episode of deep obscurity, and the longer I studied them, in an unwitting, listless way, the more pronounced and definite they became, until at last they were no more a tinted haze of uncertain tone, but a chequered plan silently passing over my shut eyelids at slow measured intervals well upon an afternoon which you will understand i shall not readily forget my eyes were suddenly opened and with a deep sigh like one who wakes after a good night's repose existence came back upon me and all motionless and dull but very consciously alive and observant i was myself again my first clear knowledge on that strange occasion was of the strains of a merle singing somewhere near and as those seraphic notes thrilled into the dry unused channels of my hearing the melody went through me to my utmost fibre next i felt as a strong tonic elixir a draught of cool spring air full of the taste of sunshine and rich with the scent of a grateful earth blowing down upon me and dissipating with its sweet breath the last mists of my sleepfulness while these soft ministrations of the good nurse nature put my blood into circulation again filling me with a gentle vegetable pleasure my newly opened eyes were astounded at the richness and variety of their early discoverings to the inexperience of my long forgetfulness everything around was quaint and grotesque everything too was grey and crimson and green as i stared and speculated with the vapid artlessness of a baby novice the new world into which i was thus born slowly took form and shape it opened out into unknown depths into aisles and corridors into a wooden firmament overhead chequered with clouds of timber-work and endless mazes to my poor untutored mind of groins and buttresses long grey walls the same that had been the groundwork of my fancy opened on either side a great bare sweep of pavement was below them and a hundred windows letting in the comely daylight above but best of all was that long one by me which the crimson sun smote strongly upon its varied surface and gleaming through the gorgeous patchwork of a dozen parables in coloured glasses fell on the ground below in pools of many-coloured brightness as i inertly watched these shifting beams i perceived in them the cause of those gay mosaics with which the outer light had amused my sleeping fancies all these things in time appeared distinct enough to me and tempted a trial of whether my physical condition equalled the apparent soundness of my senses i had hardly had leisure as yet to wonder how i had come into this strange position or to remember so strong were the demands of surrounding circumstances on my attention the last remote pages of my adventures remote i now began to entertain a certain consciousness they were i was so fully taken up with the matter of the moment that it never occurred to me to speculate beyond but the pressing question was in what sort of a body were those sparks of sight and sense burning it was pretty clear i was in a church and a greater one than i had ever entered before my position i could tell spoke of funeral rites or rather the stiff comfort of one of those marble effigies with which sculptors have from the earliest times decorated tombs 
and yet i was not entombed nor did i think i was marble or even the plaster of more frugal monumenters my eyes served little purpose in the deepening light while as yet i had not moved a muscle as i thought and speculated the dreadful fancy came across me that if i were not stone possibly i was the other extreme a thin tissue of dry dust held together by the leniency of long silence and repose and perhaps dreadful consideration the sensations of life and pleasure now felt were threading those thin wasted tissues as i have seen the red sparks reluctantly wander in the black folds of a charred scroll and finally drop out one by one for pure lack of fuel was i such a scroll the idea was not to be borne and pitting my will against the stiffness of i knew not what interval i slowly lifted my right arm and held it forth at length my chief sentiment at the moment was wonderment at the limb thus held out in the dim cathedral twilight my next was a glow of triumph at this achievement and then as something of the stress of my will was taken off and the arm flew back with a jerk to its exact place by my side a flood of pain rushed into it and with the pain came slowly at first but quickly deepening and broadening a remembrance of my previous sleeps and those other awakenings of mine attended by just such thrills i will not weary you with repetitions or recount the throes that i endured in attaining flexibility i have by heaven's mercy a determination within me of which no one is fit to speak but he who knows the extent and number of its conquests a dozen times so keen were these griefs i was tempted to relinquish the struggle and as many times i triumphed the unquenched fire of my mind but burning the brighter for each opposition at last when the painted shadows had crept up the opposite wall inch by inch and lost themselves in the upper colonnades and the gloom around me had deepened into blackness i was victorious and weak and faint and tingling but respirited and supple i lay back and slept like a child the rest did me good when i opened my eyes again it was with no special surprise for the capacity of wonder is very volatile that i saw the chancel where i lay had been lighted up and that a portly abbot was standing near clad in brown fustian corded round his ample middle and picking his teeth with a little splinter of wood as he paced up and down muttering to himself something of which i only caught such occasional fragments as fat capons spoilt roasts with a sniff in the direction of the side door of the abbey and a malison on unseemly hours with a glance at an empty confessional near me until he presently halted opposite whereon i immediately shut my eyes and regarded me with dull complacency as he did so an acolyte a pale grave recluse on whose face vigils and abnegation had already set the lines of age stepped out from the shadow and standing just behind his superior also gazed upon me with silent attention that blessed saint ambrose said the fat abbot pointing at me with his toothpick apparently for want of something better to speak about is nearly as good to us as the miraculous cruise was to the woman of sarepta what this holy foundation would do just now when all men's minds are turned to war without the pence we draw from pilgrims who come to kneel to him i cannot think indeed sir said the sad-eyed youth the good influence of that holy man knows no limit it is as strong in death as no doubt it was in life twas only this morning that by leave of our prior i brought out the great missals and there found something but not much that concerned him recite it brother quoth the abbot with a yawn and if you know anything of him beyond the pilgrim pence he draws you know more than i do nay my lord tis but little i learnt all the entries save the first in our journals are of slight value for they but record from year to year how this sum and that was spent in due keeping and care of the sleeping wonder and how many pilgrims visited this shrine and by how much mother church benefited from their dutiful generosity and the first entry what said it all too briefly sir it recorded in a faded passage that when the saintly baldwin may god assoil him 
quoth the friar crossing himself when baldwin the first norman bishop in your holiness's place came here he found yon martyr laid on a mean and paltry shelf among the brother's cells all were gone who could tell his life and history but your predecessor says the scroll judging by the outward marvel of his suspended life was certain of that wondrous body's holy beatitude and reflecting much had him meetly robed and washed and placed him here twas a good deed sighed the studious boy ah and it has told to the advantage of the monastery responded his senior and he came close up and bent low over me so that i heard him mutter strange old relic i wonder how it feels to go so long as that if indeed he lives without food it was a clever thought of my predecessor to convert the old mummy bundle of swaddles into a norman saint baldwin was almost too good a man for the cloisters with so much shrewdness he should have been a courtier oh i thought that is the way i came here is it my fat friend and i lay as still as any of my comrade monuments while the old abbot bent over me chuckling to himself a bibulous chuckle and pressing his short thick thumb into my sides as though he was sampling a plump pigeon or a gosling at a village fair by the forty saints that augustine sent to this benighted island he takes his fasting wonderfully well he is firm in gammon and brisket and by that saintly band he has even a touch of colour in his cheeks unless these flickering lights play my eyes a trick whereupon his reverence regarded me with lively admiration little witting it was more than a breathless marvel a senseless body he was thus addressing in a moment he turned again thou didst not tell me the date of this old fellow's heaven forgive me of this blessed martyr's sleep how long ago said the chronicle since this wondrous trance began my lord i computed the matter and here by that veracious unquestionable record he has lain three hundred years and more at this extraordinary statement the portly abbot whistled as though he were on a country green and i so startling so incredulous was it involuntarily turned my head towards them and gathered my breath to cast back that audacious lie but neither movement nor sign was seen for at that very moment the quiet novice laid a finger upon the monk's full sleeve and whispered hurriedly father the earl the earl and both looked down the chancel at the bottom the door swung open giving a brief sight of the pale blue evening beyond and there entered a tall and martial figure who advanced in warlike harness to the altar steps and placing down the helm decked with plumes that danced black and visionary in the dim cresset light he fell upon one knee pax vobiscum my son murmured the abbot extending his hands in blessing et vobis answered the gallant da mihi domine reverendissime misericordiam vestram and at the sound of their voices i raised me to my elbow for the young warlike earl as he bent him there was sheathed and armed in a way that i though familiar with many camps had never seen before over his fine gold hauberk was a wondrous tabard a magnificent emblazoned surtout and as he knelt the light of the waxen altar tapers twinkled upon his steel vestments they touched his yellow curls and sparkled upon the jewelled links of the chain he had about his neck they gleamed from breastplate and from belt they illuminated the thick-sewn pearls and sapphires of his sword-hilt and glanced back in subdued radiance as befitted that holy place from gauntlets and gorgets from warlike furniture and lordly gems down to the great rowels of the golden spurs that decked his knightly heels the acolyte had shrunk into the shadows and the earl had his blessing when the abbot drew him into the recess where i lay in the moonbeams that he might speak him the more privately that churchman little guessing what a good listener the stern cold saint so trim and prone upon his marble shrine could be ah noble codrington quoth the monk truly we will to the confessional at once since thou art in so much haste 
and thou shalt certainly travel the lighter for leaving thy load of transgressions to the holy forgiveness of mother church but first tell me true dost thou really sail for france to-night holy father at this very moment our vessels are waiting to be gone and all my good companions chafe and vex them for this my absence what and dost thou start for hostile shores and bloody feuds with half thy tithes and tolls unpaid to us noble earl wert thou to meet with any mischance yonder which heaven prevent and didst thou stand ill with our exchequer in this particular there were no hope for thee i tell thee thou wert as surely damned as if thou diedst owing this holy foundation aught of the poor contributions it asks of those to whom it ministers as if thy life were one long count of wickedness i will not listen i will not shrive thee until thou hast comported thyself duly in this most important particular good father thy warmth is unnecessary replied the earl my worldly matters are set straight and my steward has orders to pay thee in full all that may be owing between us to a spiritual settlement i came to seek oh quoth his reverence in an altered tone then thou art free at once to follow the promptings of thy noble instinct and serve thy king and country as thou listest i fear this will be a bloody war you go to tis like to be said the soldier brightening up and speaking out boldly on a subject he loved his fine eyes flashing with martial fire already the yellow sun of picardy flaunts on edward's royal lilies ah put in the monk and no doubt ripens many a butt of noble malmsey already the red soil of flanders is redder by the red blood of our gallant chivalry yet even then not half so red good earl as the ripe brew of burgundy a jolly mellow brew that has stood in the back part of the cellar secure in the loving forbearance of twenty masters talk of renown talk of thy lemon talk of humour and the breaking of spears what are all these to such a vat of beaded pleasures i tell thee codrington not even the fabled pool wherein the rhymers say the cursed paynim looks to foretaste the delights of his sinful heaven reflects more joy than such a cobweb tub would that i had more of them added the bibulous old priest after a pause and sighing deeply as he did so an idea occurred to him for he exclaimed look thee my gallant boy thou art bound whither all this noble stuff doth come from and tis quite possible in the rough and tumble of bloody strife thou mayst be at the turning inside out of many a fat roost and many a well-stocked cellar now if this be so and thou wilt remember me when thou seest the gallant drink about to be squandered on the loose gullets of base scullion troopers why then tis a bargain and in paternal acknowledgment of this thy filial duty i will hear thy confession now and thy penance i promise shall not be such as will inconvenience thine active life the knight bent his head somewhat coldly i thought and then they turned and went over to the oriel confessional where the moonlight was throwing from the window above a pallid pearly transcript of the mother and her sweet nazarene babe all in silver and opal tints upon the sacred woodwork and as the priest's black shadow blotted the tender picture out i heard him say but mind it must be good and ripe tis that vintage with the two white crosses down by the vents that i like best and thou sendest me any sour calais layman tipple thou art a forsworn heretic with all thy sin afresh upon thee so discriminate and the worthy churchman entered to shrive and forgive and as the casement closed upon him the sweet silent indifferent shadows from above blossomed again upon the doorway dreamy and drowsy i lay back and thought and wondered for how long i know not but for long until the dim aisles had grown midnight silent and the moon had set and then an owl hooted on the ledges outside and at that sound with a start and a sigh i awoke once more fools i muttered thinking over what i had heard with dreamy in sequence fools liars to set such a date upon this rest of mine 
drunken churls i will go at once to my fair saxon to my sweet nestlings that is if they be not yet to bed and to-morrow i will give that meagre acolyte such a lesson in the misreading of his missile margins as shall last him till doomsday by st dunstan he shall play no more pranks with me and yet and yet my heart misgives me my soul is loaded with foreboding my spirit is sick within me where have i come to who am i gods ilapi amenti of the golden egyptian past Skogula, mister of the saxon hills and woods grant that this not be some new mischance some other horrible lapse and i sat up there on the white stone and bowed my head and dangled my apostolic heels against my own commemorative marbles below while gusts of alternate dread and indignation swept through the leafless thickets of remembrance presently these meditations were disturbed by some very different outward sensations there came stealing over the consecrated pavements of that holy pile the sound of singing and it did not savour of angelic harmony it was rough and jolly and warbled and tripped about the columns and altar steps in most unseemly sprightliness surely never did st gregory pen such a rousing chorus as that i thought to myself as with ears pricked i listened to the dulcet harmonies and along with the music came such a merry odour as made me thirsty to smell of it twas not incense twas much more like cinnamon and nutmegs and never did censer never did myrrh and galbanum smell so much of burnt sack and roasted crab apples as that unctuous appetising taint i got down at once off my slab and being mighty hungry as i then discovered i followed up that trail like a sleuth hound on a slot it was not reverent it did not suit my saintship but down the steps i went hot and hungry and past the reredos and crossed the apse and round the pulpit and over the curricula and through the aisles and by many a shrine where the tapers dimly burnt i pressed and so with the scent breast high i flitted through an open archway into the chequered cloisters then tripping heedlessly over the lettered slabs that kept down the dust of many a roistering abbas i the latest hungry one of the countless hungry children of time followed down that jolly trail my apostolic linens tucked under my arm jewelled mitre on a head more accustomed to soldier wear and golden crook carried alas like a hunter lance a trail in my other hand till i brought the quest to bay at the end of the cloisters was a door set ajar and along by the jam a mellow streak of yellow light was streaming out rich with those odours i had smelt and laden with laughter and the sound of wine-soaked voices noisy over the end it might be of what seemed a goodly supper i advanced to the light listened a moment and then in my imperious way pushed wide the panel and entered it was the refectory of the monastery and a right noble hall wherein ostentation and piety struggled for dominion overhead the high peaked ceiling was a maze of cunningly wrought and carved woodwork dark with time and harmonised with the assimilating touches of age round by the ample walls right and left ran a corridor into the dim far distance and crucifix and golden ewer cunning saintly image and noble branching silver candlesticks gleamed in the dusk against the ebony and polish of balustrade and panelling under the heavy glow of all these things the brother's bare wooden table extended in long demure lines but wooden platter and black leathern mugs were now all deserted and empty it was from the upper end came the light and jollity here a wider table was placed across the breadth of the hall and upon it all was sumptuous magnificence holy poverty here had capitulated to priestly arrogance silver and gold and rare glasses from cunning italian moulds enriched about with shining enamels wherein were limbed many an ancient heathen fancy shone and sparkled on that monkish board on either side in mighty candelabra bequeathed by superstition and fear there twinkled a hundred waxen candles and up to the flames of these steamed as i looked many a costly dish uncovered 
and many a mellow brew beaded and shining to the very brim of those jewelled horns and beakers that were chief accessories to that pleasant spread they who sat here seemed if a layman might judge right well able to do justice to these things half a dozen of them jolly rosy priors and prelates were round that supper-table rubicund with wine and feeding and in the high carved chair coif thrown back from head his round ruddy face aflush with liquor his fat red hand asprawl about his flagon and his small eyes glazed and stupid in his drunkenness sat my friend the latest abbot of st olaf's fane he had been singing and as i entered the last distich died away upon his lips his round close-cropped head o'erwhelmed with the wine he loved so much sank down upon the table the red vintage ran from the overturned beaker in a crimson streak and while his boon comrades laughed long and loud his holiness slept unmindful it was at this very moment that i entered and stood there in my ghostly linen stern and pale with fasting and frowning grimly upon those godless revellers jove it was a sight to see them blanche to see the terror leap from eye to eye as each in turn caught sight of me to see their jolly jaws drop down and watch the sickly pallor sweeping like icy wind across their countenances so grim and silent did we face each other in that stern moment that not a finger moved not a pulse i think there beat in all their bodies and in that mighty hall not a sound was heard save the drip drip of the abbot's malmsey upon the floor and his own husky snoring as he lay asleep amid the costly litter of his swinish meal stern inflexible there by the black backing of the portal i frowned upon them i whom they only deemed of as a saint dead three hundred years before i whom lifeless they knew so well now stood vengeful upon their threshold scowling scorn and contempt from eyes where no life should have been can you doubt but that they were sick at heart with pallid cheeks answering to coward consciences for long we remained so and then with a wild yell of terror they were all on foot and like homing bats by a cavern mouth were scrambling and struggling into the gloom of the opposite doorway i let them escape then stalking over to the archway thrust the wicket too upon the heels of the last flyer and glad to be so rid of them shot the bolt into the socket and barred that entry then i went back to my friend the abbot and stood reflective behind him wondering whether it were not a duty to humanity to rid it of such a knave even as he slept there but when i stood at his elbow contemplating him the unwonted silence told upon his dormant faculties and presently the heavy head was raised and after an inarticulate murmur or two he smiled imbecilely and picking up the thread of his revelry hiccuped out the chorus good brothers the chorus and all together the highway must but let us die drinking at an inn hold the wine cup to our lips sparkling from the bin so when the angels flutter down to take us from our sin ah god have mercy on these sots the cherubs will begin why you rogues he said as his drunken melody found no echo in the great hall why you sleepy villains am i a strolling troubadour that i should sing thus alone to you and then as his bleared and dazzled eyes wandered round the empty places the spilt wine and overturned trestles he smiled again with drunken cunning ah he muttered then they must be all under the tables i thought that last round of sack would finish them hello there ambrose de vaux jolly comrades sleepy dogs come forth fie on ye to call yourselves good monks and yet to leave thy simple kindly prior thus to himself and he pulled up the table linen and peered below sorely was the churchman perplexed to see nothing and first he glared up among the oaken rafters as though by chance his fellows had flown thither and then he stared at the empty places 
and so his gaze wandered round until in a minute or two it had made the complete circle of the place and finally rested on me standing immovable a pace from his elbow at first he stared upon me with vapid amusement and then with stupid wonder but was not more than a second or two before the truth dawned upon that hazy intellect and then i saw the thick short hands tighten upon the carving of his priestly throne i saw the wine flush pale upon his cheeks and the drunken light in his eyes give place to the glare of terror and consternation just as they had done before him but with infinite more intensity he blanched and withered before my unrelenting gaze he turned in a moment before my grim imperious frown from a jolly rubicund old bibber rosy and quarrelsome with his supper into a cadaverous sober-minded confessor lantern-jawed and yellow and then with a hideous cry he was on foot and flying for the doorway by which his friends had gone but i had need of that good confessor and ere he could stagger a yard the golden apostolic crook was about the ankle of the errant sheep and the prior of st olaf's rolled over headlong upon the floor i sat down to supper and as i helped myself to venison pasty and malmsey i heard the beads running through the recumbent abbot's fingers quicker than water runs from a spout after a summer thunder shower misericordia domine nobis murmured the old sinner and i let him grovel and pray in his abject panic for a time then bade him rise now the fierceness of this command was somewhat marred because my mouth was very full just then of pasty crust and the accents appeared to carry less consternation into my friend's heart than i had intended the pater noster began to run with more method and coherence and soon finding he was not yet half way to that nether abyss he had seen opening before him he plucked up a little heart of grace besides the avenger was at supper and making mighty inroads into the provender the abbot loved so well this took off the rough edge of terror and was in itself so curious a phenomenon that little by little with the utmost circumspection the monk raised his head and looked at me i kept my baleful eyes turned away and busied me with my loaded platter which by the way was far the most interesting item of the two and so by degrees he gained confidence and came into a sitting position and gazed at the hungry saint so active with the victuals wonder and awe playing across his countenance i see sir priest i said you have a good cook yonder in the buttery but the abbot was as yet too dazed to answer so i went on to put him more at his ease for i designed to ask him some questions later on now where i come from the great fault of the cooks is they appreciate none of your norman niceties they broil and roast for ever as though every one had a hunter appetite and thus i have often been weary of their eternal messes of pork and kine holy saints quoth the abbot i did not dream you had any cooks at all no cooks thou fat wine-vat what didst thou think we ate our viands raw heaven forbid the abbot gasped but truly your sanctity's experiences astound me tis all against the canons and if they be thus as you say at their trenches may i ask in all humbleness and humility how your blessed friends are at their flagons ah sir good fellows enough my jolly comrades but caring little for thy red and purple vintages liking better the merry ale that autumn sends and the honeyed mead yet in their way as merry roisterers for the most part as though they were all norman abbots i said glancing askance at him by this time the prior was on his feet as sober as could be but apparently infinitely surprised and perplexed at what he saw and heard he cogitated and then he diffidently asked and were it not too presumptive might i ask if your saintship knows the blessed oswald not i nor yet the holy sewell de montaigne he queried with a sigh once head of these halls and cells never heard of him in my life nor yet of grindal or gerard of bayeux or the saintly anselm my predecessor in that chair you fill groaned the jolly confessor i tell you priest i know none of them 
never heard their names or aught of them till now alas alas quoth the monk then if none of these have won to heaven if none of these are known to thee so newly thence there can be but small hope for me and his fat round chin sank upon his ample chest and he heaved a sigh that set the candles all a-flickering half way down the table why priest what art thou talking of paradise and long dead saints twas of the saxons harold saxons my jolly comrades and allies in arms when last in life i spoke ho oh, oh, ho was that so why i thought thou wert talking of things celestial all this while though in truth thy speech sorted astounding ill with all i had heard before i think father i responded there is more burnt sack under thy ample girdle than wit beneath thy cowl but never mind we will not quarrel sit down fill yon tankard for dryness will not i fancy improve thy eloquence and tell me soberly something of this nap of mine ah but sir i was never very good at such studious work the monk replied seating himself with uneasy obedience if i might but fetch in our clerk though in truth i cannot imagine why and whither he has gone he is one who has by heart the things thou wouldst know stir a foot priest i said with feigned anger and thou art but a dead abbot tell me so much as your muddled brain can recall now when i supped here before that yellow-skinned norman william sat upon the english throne saints in paradise what he who routed harold and founded yonder abbey of battle impossible what dost thou bandy thy impossible with me slave if thou cast again but one atom of doubt one single iota of thy heretic criticism here thou shalt go thyself to perdition and seek Sewell de montaigne and gerard of bayeux and i lay my hand upon my crook misericordia misericordia stammered the abbot i meant no ill whatever but the extent of thy holiness is astounding abstinence overwhelmed me why then to your story but i am foolish to ask you cannot you dare not tell me again that lie of thy acolyte that three hundred years have passed since then look up say to us false and that single word shall unburden here and i struck my breast a soul of a load of dread and fear heavier than ever was lifted by priestly absolution before but still he hung his face and i heard him mutter that fifty white-boned abbots lay in the cloisters heel to head and the first one was a kinsman of william's and the last one was his own predecessor then if thou darest not answer this question who reigns above us now has the norman star set as i once hoped it might behind the red cloud of rebellion or does it still shine to the shame of all saxons sir saint answered the monk with a little touch of the courage and pride of his race gleaming for a moment through his drunken humility rebellion never scared the norman power so much i know for certain and saxon and norman are one by the grace of god linked in brotherhood under the noble edward expurgate thy divergences erase invaders and invaded from thy memory and drink as i drink if indeed all this be news to thee for the first time to england and to english was hal sir monk england and the english drink hal good saint he answered and giving me the right acceptance of my flagon challenge and i do hereby receive thee most paternally into the national fold nevertheless thou art the most perplexing martyr that ever honoured this holy fane and he raised the great silver cup to his lips and took a mighty pull then he gazed reflectively for a moment into the capacious measure as though the pageantry of history were passing across the shining bottom in fantastic sequence and looked up and said most wonderful most wonderful why then you know nothing of william the red the william i knew was red enough in the hands ah but this other one who followed him was red on the head as well and an anselm was archbishop while he reigned well and who came next in thy preposterous tale henry plantagenet unless all this sack confuses my memory i have told thee good saint i am better at mass and breviar than at missals and scroll and better no doubt than either at thy cellar score-book priest 
but what befell your henry frankly i am not very certain but but he died eventually tis the want of kings no less than of lesser folk pass me yon bread platter and fill thy flagon so much history i see makes thee husky and sad well then came stephen de blois the son of adeliza who was daughter to the conqueror forsworn priest i exclaimed at that familiar name leaping to my feet and swinging the great gold flail into the air that is a falser lie than any yet the noble adeliza was troth to harold and had no children unsay it or and here the crook poised ominously over the shrieking abbot's head i lied i lied yelled the monk cowering under the swing of my weapon like a partridge beneath the falcon's circlings and then as the crook was thrown down on the table again he added twas a dealer i meant but what it should matter to thee whether it were adeliza or a dealer passes my comprehension and the monk smoothed out his ruffled feathers proceed it is not for thee to question wrought stephen anything more notable to thy mind than henry <clears throat> well sir i recall now thou puttest me to it that he laid rough hands upon the sacred persons of our bishops once or twice yet he was much indebted to them didst ever draw sword in a good quarrel sir saint didst ever put thy fingers into a venison pasty sir priest because if thou hast as often and oftener have i done according to thy supposition why then i wonder you lay still upon yonder white marble slab while all the northern bishops were up in arms for stephen and on bloody northallerton moor broke the power of the cruel northmen for ever that day sir the sacred flags of saint cuthbert of durham saint peter of york saint john of beverley saint wilfrid of ripon not to mention the holy thurston's ruddy pennon led the van of battle tis all set out in a pretty scroll that we have over the priory fireplace else as you will doubtless guess i had never remembered so much of detail anyhow it is well recalled who came next another henry and he made the saintly thomas becket archbishop in the year of grace eleven hundred and sixty-two and afterwards the holy prelates was gathered to bliss thy history is mostly exits and entries but perhaps it is none the less accurate for all that and now thou wilt say this henry was no more lasting than his kinsman he too died completely and wholly sir so that the burly richard coeur de lion reigned in his stead and then came john who was at best but a wayward vassal of st peter's chair down with him jolly abbot and mount another on the shaky throne of thy fantastic narrative i am weary of the succession already and since we have come so far away from where i thought we were i care for no great niceties of detail put thy sovereigns to the amble make them trot across the stage of thy hazy recollection or thou wilt be asleep before thou canst stall and stable half of them well then a henry came after john and an edward followed him then another of the name then a third that noble edward in whose sway the realm now is and in whom save some certain exactions of rent and taxes mother church perceives a glorious and warlike son but it is a long muster roll from the time of thy norman monarch to this year of grace thirteen hundred and forty six a long roll i muttered to myself turning away from my empty plate horrible immense and vast good lord what shadows are these men who come and go like this wonderful and dreadful that all those tinselled puppets of history those throbbing epitomes of passion and godlike hopes should have budded and decayed and passed out into the void finding only their being to my mind in the shallow vehicle of this base churchman's wine vault's breath dreadful quaint abominable to think that all these flickering human things have paced across the sunny white screen of life like the coloured fantasies yonder stained windows threw upon my sleeping eyes and yet i only but wake hungry and empty unchanged unmindful careless priest i said aloud so sudden and fiercely that the monk leapt to his feet with a startled cry from the drunken sleep into which he had fallen priest dost fear the fires of thy purgatory ah oh, glorious miracle but but surely thou wouldst not why then answer me truly 
swear by that great crucified form there shining in the taper light above thy throne swear by him to whom thou nightly offerest the hyssop incense of thy beastly excesses swear i say i do i do exclaimed st olaf's priest in extravagant terror as i towered before him with all my old phrygian fire emphasized by the sanctity of my extraordinary repute i swear he said but seeing me hesitate he added what wouldst thou of thy poor unworthy servant twas not so easy to answer him and i hung my head for a moment then said when i died in the norman time thou rememberest there was a woman here and two sunny little ones blue in the eyes and comely to look upon there shut thy stupid mouth and look not so astounded i tell thee they were here here in st olaf's hall here at this very high table between me and st olaf's abbot three tender flowers old man set in the black framing of a hundred of thy corded wondering brotherhood now tell me tell me the very simple truth is there such a woman here tall and fair and melancholy gracious are there such babes in thy cloisters or cells it is against the canons of our order a malison on thee and thy order is there then no effigy in yon chancel no tablet no record of her i mean of that noble lady and those comely little ones i know of none sir saint think again she was a franklin she had wide lands she reverenced thy church and in her grief being woman she would turn devout surely she built some shrine or made thee a portico or blazoned a window to shame rough fate with the evidence of her gentleness there is none such in st olaf's but now thou speakest of shrines i do remember one some hours ride from here unroofed and rotten but nevertheless such as you suggest and in it there is a cenotaph and a woman laid out straight she is cracked across the middle and mossy and there be two small kneeling figures by her head but i never looked nicely to determine whether they were blessed cherubim or but common children the shepherds who keep their flocks there and shelter from the showers under the crumbling walls call the place vorwood enough priest i said as i paced hither and thither across the hall in gloomy grief and then taking my hasty resolution i turned to him sternly make what capital thou list of to-night's adventure but remember the next time thou seest a saint may heaven pity thee if thou art not in better sort turn thy face to the wall the frightened abbot obeyed i shed in a white heap upon the floor my saintly vestments my mitre and crook upon top and then stepping lightly down the hall mounted upon a bench unfastened and threw open a lattice and placing my foot upon the sill sprang out into the night and open world again i walked and ran until the day came southwards constantly now and again asking my way of an astonished hind but for the most part guided by some strange instinct and before the following noon i was at my old saxon homestead but could it be vorward not a vestige of a house anywhere in that wide grassy glade where vorward stood not a sign of life not a sound to break the stillness near by there ran a little brook and against it just as the monk had said were the four grey walls of a lonely roofless shrine over the shrine on the very spot where vorward stood alas alas was a long grassy knoll crowned with hawthorns and little flowers shining in the sunlight i went into the ruined chapel and there stained and lichened and broken in the thorny embrace of the brambles lay the marble figure of my sweet saxon wife and by the pillow green velveted with the tapestry of nature knelt her little ones on either side i dropped upon my knee and buried my face in her crumbling bosom and wept what mattered the eclipse while i slept of all those kingly planets that had shone in the english firmament compared to the setting of this one white star of mine i rushed outside to the mound that hid the forgotten foundations of my home and as the passion swept up and engulfed my heart i buried my head in my arms and hurled myself upon the ground and cursed that tender green moss that should have been so hard 
curse that golden english sunlight that suited so ill with my sorrows and cursed again and again in my bitterness those lying blossoms overhead that showered down their petals on me saying it was spring when it was the blackest winter of desolation the night-time of my disappointment End of chapter 8